Hello, I'm Michelle Kaufman, the Communications Director at Family Life International New Zealand. Today, myself and my colleague Brad are bringing you a very special interview with Robert Cahoon, the Director of International Campaigns for 40 Days for Life. 40 Days for Life is a global campaign that aims to end abortion locally through prayer, fasting, community outreach and peaceful all-day vigil in front of abortion facilities. You may already know that FLI facilitates 40 Days for Life in Auckland and Wellington each Lent. The next vigil begins on Ash Wednesday, 2nd of March 2022. I do hope that you can join us in this very special mission. So welcome Robert to the show. Uh, as a 40 Days for Life leader, here in New Zealand, I've always appreciated your upbeat support and sound advice. So I'm really excited that you're here with us today and that you can share with our listeners the impact that 40 Days for Life is having um, throughout the world and the importance of this effort in bringing about an end to abortion. So um, could you start by telling us a little bit about yourself and, and how you actually got involved with the pro-life movement as a whole? Absolutely. So I'm 38 years old and I've got four children, seven and under at home, got married eight years ago. And I'm a Catholic convert. I became a Catholic at university when I was 21. And it wasn't uh, I, when I was at university, I went to a talk by Lord Alton, who is a member of the House of Lords, who showed the graphic reality of abortion at a university halls residence talk. And that woke me up to the reality of abortion in the world and 200,000 abortions a year in the UK and from that moment onwards I thought wow this is the social justice issue of our age and I was received into the Catholic Church age 21 in 2004 um, and looked at my vocation at that time and I went to public school prior to that um, fairly sort of privileged upbringing uh, I thought I did history at university I thought it's going to work in the, the city um, being a banker or something when I was at university but God had other plans and I tried my vacation uh, at the seminary for a couple of years. Um, I then spent a year as a missionary in Canada with NET Ministries, who were also in Australia. And it was in that time in Canada, I saw a prayer vigil outside the uh, abortion centre near the Canadian Parliament in Ottawa. And that was the first time I'd ever seen something like that. It was the Morgan Tyler Abortion Centre. And a lot of el elderly people praying in the street. I thought, wow, I've never seen this before. This is really interesting. And coming back to the UK, I did talks in schools for young people on, on chastity for a year or two. And after that, I felt that God was calling me to start 40 Days for Life in the UK. It was actually a talk by David B. Wright. Um, it was called Keep God in America. It was a rally in Florida. The organiser thought several thousand people yeah. were going to come to it. And in the end, about 100 people turned up to the tour, to the, to the speech. But his speech was just... Uh, amazing it was on youtube and this was going back in 2009 and i really felt that good uh, 2010 i think it was and i really felt that god was calling me to start 40 days for life in the uk so we visited uh, the mary stopes in central london and we said like a prayer for a, an hour or so outside and somebody said a few rude words walking past but never realized kind of what was happening at that point and that's really how i i got involved 11 years ago um organizing the first prayer vigil in london so yeah, I wasn't always super keen pro-lifer. It was really kind of waking up at, at university to become a Catholic and then realise the importance of the pro-life movement from that point onwards. Fantastic. Awesome. Awesome story. Yeah. And um, tell us more about the 40 Days for Life in the UK for starters, if you don't mind. So from those early beginnings, what does it look like now? Has it grown? And yeah, so we started our first prayer vigil outside Mary Stokes in central London in 2010 in September. And we, I mean, we really thought this was going to be a complete failure. I thought, like, who is going to turn up in public to pray for an end to abortion? Like, I mean, this is a controversial topic and Christians don't want to stand in public. You know, people are going to insult them and nobody's going to come along. This is going to be a complete failure. So I, I genuinely believe that. And so I thought, well, let's just get out there and just give it a go and see, see what happens. But what I didn't calculate was there's hundreds of uh, people out there who kind of feel disenfranchised and don't feel an outlet for their pro-life views. And, you know, they've tried everything politically, pastorally as kind of exasperation. And 
So there is a real market and interest for people doing this. It was a new approach. It was something novel. Uh, we got all the young people involved. We said, hey, you know, you might meet your future husband or wife outside the abortion <laughs> centre if you come along. You know, used every trick in the book to get people there. And uh, we had a thousand people come along to the first ever vigil. I just couldn't believe it. Wow. I mean, we saw six babies saved um, the second day of the vigil. It's a couple going in there. They don't allow born children in the abortion centre. So the, the two born children had to stay with a boyfriend outside. He talked to the volunteers 15 minutes and then he rushed in to get his girlfriend and they left never to, to come back again. And then we just had story after story like this of um, a woman had a dream and she thought, you know, her baby was calling out to her the night before the abortion saying, mommy, mommy, please don't abort me. And so she talked with a pavement counsellor. She decided not to go ahead with the abortion. Another woman walked down the line of volunteers, shook their hands. Every single one of them said, thank you so much for being here. I'm so lucky to have friends like you. And there's similar text messages saying, you know, thank you that is so much for being here today. And we had similar messages of the opposite variety telling us where to go and, you know, anger, and, <laughs> anger and screaming. So, um, and fa fast forwards, um, you know, I've had a lot of opposition, um, but the campaign spread all around the country. So we've now got like about 15 vigils every year. And it's a very secular place, the UK, very similar to New Zealand. And um, so we've had an adventure all, all around the country. We've seen over a thousand babies saved in 10 years of ministry. And th those are just the ones we know about, really the true figures, probably mm. 10, 10 times higher. So there's so many stories you don't hear about. And, you're really reaching people's consciences and minds and uh yeah it's it's been it's been an incredible adventure really so and ups and downs roller coaster ride and i've been all around the world as well visiting other countries too um a big inspiration from the us they're, they're about 10 years ahead in terms of the pro-life movement but um you know it's it's a great battleground and and taking the perspective of community organizing and prayer this is a great angle and approach for the pro-life movement too praise god so with that, um, you know, it's so effective. And what is the difference between the prayer and witness and fasting that 40 Days for Life does and um, as opposed to, say, protesting, like making a political protest outside an abortion centre? What's what? Can you point out the differences between the different approaches there? Yeah, that's a really great question. And, you know, you think of somebody uh, who's building a house and, you know, they've got bricks and mortar and they're just building a house. And you think of somebody who's building a cathedral that takes hundreds of years. It's a kind of act of worship. And, you know, they're giving glory to God at the same time as building the cathedral. Um, so there's a huge distinction between someone just materially building a house versus someone who's building a cathedral, which is, an, you know, an, a place of worship uh, and, you know, and their work in and of itself has dignity, worth, value. It's exactly the same thing with a prayer vigil versus a protest. You know, a protest is just standing there with a sign saying, you know, uh, abortion kills babies, whatever it is. Um, and you're standing there and you're protesting it. And, you know, sure, on a secular level, uh, you're telling the public that abortion is wrong. They might walk past, see your sign and have a thought about it. But with a prayer vigil, um, you know, the whole point of 40 Days for Life is to turn to God in a spirit of prayer, humility, repentance, fasting, uh, turning to God in, in that spirit of, you know, we can't do things in and of ourselves, but if we turn to God, that he is going to transform our country. He's going to save lives. And so we're there to pray for an end to abortion. And with prayer, we can move mountains. Um, most incredible things can happen in and through prayer. So it's, we're not there in a spirit of self-righteousness. And, you know, often people think this, you know, that we're there to tell people they're going to hell and <laughs> they're going to be judged and what have you. Um, you know, prayer is, and, and prayer ultimately, this is how God works at the prayer vigil. So, you know, there's your own personal transformation that can happen through the prayer vigil. So you can come to the prayer vigil, pray for an hour. Like we had a teacher come to the prayer vigil. He prayed for an hour and then he went back to his school and he told her like a thousand people about the pro-life message. So he prayed for an hour and that's how he was personally transformed. So he realized he could do something at his school to help pro-life movement. And so that's how he was transformed. It might help us spiritually grow and 90% of people experience spiritual growth. Then the other ways that, um, we see women who change their minds and don't go ahead with abortions. Now, not only is the baby saved, but the woman might avoid a lifetime of regrets 
and also um you know you've got that's going to impact that family for generations to come so also men and women can be led into post-abortion healing programs that are proven um so you can reach people who've had abortions several million women in britain have had an abortion maybe they haven't had healing transformation hope after that experience you can be the uh, gateway to help somebody into a healing healing from that experience it might take decades to find healing so helping men and women into proven post-abortion healing programs a phenomenal job deacon friend of mine says the most amount of uh, transformation he's seen in his priestly ministry has been in his ministry as the church has been seeing people on these programs go from you know zero to 100 one guy turned up in sort of goth clothing and he, he finished it sort of wearing all white clothing and that was symbolic of the spiritual transformation that he had on that program uh, also helping promote chastity among young people um and also getting good stories in the media um helping reach out community reaching out you know there's thousands of people walk past the vigil every day in london and you know you're able to witness to every single one of those per- people and you know god can work through, through people's consciences we've had people say well, i don't like your message but i admire the way in which you're doing it so the witness is so powerful and paul VI said you know we don't need teachers, we need witnesses, you know, witnesses is what we really need. So to stand outside the place where abortions happen, that's where abortion is happening in the community, not in the parliament, not in the courts, not in the schools, it's happening at the abortion centre. And you're bringing God, you're bringing prayer, and you're bringing hope. It's one of the places that has so little hope. So you are to be the hands and feet of Christ right where the abortions are happening. And because of that, this is why we've seen so many babies saved and they've tried everything to try and get rid of us here in the UK. And it's a spiritual battle between life and death. And so seeing this as a spiritual perspective of a battle between life and death, I can't name any other Christian ministry that you can save lives on such a direct and tangible way Like most surgeons don't try and save a life every single day of their career, but as a pavement counsellor, you're there. You can literally save lives every single day while you're there, like every single conversation. And some of our pavement counsellors have been so good that every every conversation has been like a you know a god conversation with somebody at the last moment and even if one in a hundred people you know have a conversation it's so worth being there. So that's the kind of perspective of of why this is important outside the abortion centres. You mentioned um, just then that you were ta- uh, that we can move mountains, and um, when we stand outside our local abortion facility, there's a trucking company that comes past, and their slogan is "We move mountains." So every time the trucks go past, it's almost like God saying to us, "You know, you can have you've got faith as small as a mustard seed, sometimes even smaller than a mustard seed, but we can move mountains with that." And I just when you said that, I thought that that is the thing. We're, we're there in humility and um, we're there total trust of God and all of our lack, lack he kind of fills it and mm. we can just reach out and save those lives. It's um, quite incredible. And as you say, sometimes we just don't know how God is using us. So it's, it's quite exciting to hear how that's happening too in in the UK. Can you tell us maybe about some of the other places in the world where um, people are moving mountains by being present on the street and saving lives? Absolutely. Well, I've been to about 30 countries in the last 10 years, um, taking full stage for life to other countries, trying to get campaigns going, and then eventually leading to nationwide campaigns. So some of the most successful countries, Croatia is just on fire. It's a strongly Catholic country, 4 million people. And so we we now have prayer vigils outside every single hospital where abortions happen in Croatia. And they've now got five life centers, about five, six people working for them now. And so we we went on a mission trip there 2014 and they just had one vigil in Zagreb. Um, Leader kind of opened the Bible at 2 Chronicles 7.14, which is a key passage for us. Um, with 40 Days for Life starting and he saw a dove at the vigil kind of at the very, very beginning. But the the creations are really on fire and they've got so much passion, um, such lovely people. I've I've been there many times, four or five times now. And just so great to see like a nationwide campaign spread from, from, you know, to see it from the very beginning to, to spread and to grow in a, a great generation to witness for life and, and to also meet some of the babies in other countries, um, you know, they've been saved from forced for life and met uh, a couple of the babies that have been saved from abortion in, in Croatia. So, 
Um, just so beautiful to see that. And, you know, we're, where we are as an organization now in America, over 50 of the vigils now are a year round vigils. They're 365. Uh, we've got two or three in the UK that are year round. And um, so things have really grown. You know, I think that the, the big campaigns have got bigger and, and you know, those opportunities have grown as well. We also had um, Catherine uh, was then Britain in 2015. She did an internship with Four Days for Life. She went to Colombia and in Bogota, they again, first campaign there, very strong Catholic country in, in Colombia. And that vigil has now grown to over 50 vigils around the country. So just amazing to see that happen. And uh, they have a baby shower for the mums that choose life every year. So it's an event and about 25 mums come along. They give them a baby box as well. Uh, just, you know, so beautiful to see, so beautiful to see, so, you know, the spiritual fruits, to be able to see the spiritual fruits so, so strongly. Um, yeah, there's in, in Bogota, there's about 70 doctor surgeries that are abortion centers around like this large district. And there's like men outside that are offering free ultrasounds to women kind of like trying to sell abortions on the streets. And so it's a very high concentration of abortion centers right in the capital there. And they just started with one vigil, but God has really grown that sort of beyond our wildest imaginations. We now got several hundred um, campaigns in Latin America. So um, really beautiful to see. I think this work is very much like, it's like you've got a pickaxe and you're hitting against an ice lake and you're, you're doing all the hard work and you're not seeing any tangible results. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're hitting the ice and just nothing has happened, but you know, you keep going over years and years and then, you know, it's God who is really doing the work. And at some point cracks begin to appear in the ice and then, you know, more cracks appear in the ice and gradually a major crack appears uh, in the ice lake and at some point the entire ice you know ice covering just collapses and that's really how i describe this work you, you, you work really hard you don't see any tangible results but then suddenly you get a get a major breakthrough and i think that you've got to have hope beyond hope and we've seen that in london you know been there for 10 years and, and suddenly something really big happens so um I, I think you know you've got to have hope beyond sort of the hopelessness of, of the situation of, of um, seeing so many abortions uh, in front of you and, and knowing that God is in charge and no matter how bad things are, that he's always in control. And we don't know how God uses our prayers. So there's an element of mystery and there's an element of faith. So like we have to believe that what we're doing is the right thing and that God will use our presence in the right way to, you know, change hearts and minds. But, well, you know, I've been privileged to see tangibly uh, examples of that and there's, there's plenty of them. So um, take courage. You're doing the right, all the right things. <laughs> Thank you. That's a <clears throat> great segue actually, Robert, because we wanted to ask you about one of those success stories in London. We saw a headline the other week that read about one of those clinics, um, Marie Stopes, that I think you mentioned. I don't know if it was the very one where the vigils first started in London, but we saw that one of the, the big ones has recently closed there. So we're wondering if you would share us what you know about that story. Yes. Yeah, so uh, this was where our vigil first started in London 11 years ago. And we've had a nearly permanent prayer vigil there organized by the Good Council Network for uh, just under a decade. And we've seen hundreds of women who have chosen life outside Mary Stokes house. It was the first birth control clinic in the United Kingdom in Holloway. And then they moved to central London. So it's an iconic building and they have a blue plaque outside dedicated to Mary Stokes and Mary Stokes have become a little bit woke now. So Mary Stokes, the person has gone out the window and they've renamed themselves MSI reproductive choices as they're sort of okay. renouncing her eugenic history. Um, but to see this flagship iconic building close and also where our campaign first started, you know, it's an unthinkable result. We've never thought that that would be possible. And, you know, Mary Stokes have written us letters trying to sue us, trying to get rid of us. They've had a five year campaign trying to bring in buffer zones. Um, so half the abortions are happening at home after the coronavirus regulations allowed abortion at home. So half of the women are having abortions at home at the moment. It means half of them aren't coming to the clinic. This is why some of the big places are closing. But um, to see this place close, just so many great memories there. And yeah, it's it's been you know um, it's been it's been uh, some interesting stories. One of our volunteers from Ecuador once thought that the the prayer vigil was inside the building and it's like the first time he came so he knocked on the door and then he realized his mistake and he get, went to join the prayer 
prayer vigil, at which point one of the <laughs> one of the abortion staff came out and gave us a mouthful. But um, there was a student hall of residence across the road from the abortion <laughs> centre as well. And uh, they used to play pranks on us. So they used to pretend that they were God and pour buckets of water on our volunteers and put up signs on their doors because they were right by the prayer vigil saying, for Lent, I'm giving up my anti-abortion protest. Um, but we had a prayer vigil there on the penultimate day of the first campaign. We had 55 people praying there. And we even heard students praying inside the building. And I thought, wow, at this point, this is contagious. Like if even the students are joining in with the prayers inside the building, the ones who are Christian were kind of liked, liked the uh, like the vigil. But we also heard women who were screaming inside the building, some who were sick, just immediately leaving. Um, but it's been a great, a great place to have a prayer vigil. One of the, the um, pavement counsellors, he brought his baby to work one day and everyone was cooing the baby on the train. But when he got to the abortion centre, the baby was kind of enemy number one and, um, mm. and uh, was not given a welcome reception whatsoever. But just the continued prayers, like, you know, just abs absolutely incredible. And, you know, we've got pills by post now here a lot and it's anonymous sort of nurse led, very, very poor um very very poor abortion provision here it's it's a, a, a huge step backwards but you know that to see such a huge result and the bigger picture is mary stokes are providing so many abortions in africa we'd love to reach out to africa much more and just say look this is awful this is awful abortion provision that's being provided there to wake up the christians in these countries who are 80 90 percent of these countries are kind of pro-life and christian and this is being imposed on them by the west and that's the bigger picture this is where mary states really have you know a very strong uh, amount of presence and money going to africa so this is the next step is is to reach out to these countries really effectively and have a very very strong presence there um was it in africa the one of the um latest people to come out of the abortion industry um, i heard a podcast recently is that was he involved with marie stopes in africa or was that a different yes, organization the, yes we did a podcast with kevin duffy who's a former sort of senior executive um for marie stopes and he worked for them for five or six years he has extensive senior experience and i've been working with him uh, working with him, um, he's done several podcasts here in the UK. He's been helping the pro-life movement now. So he's kind of our Abby Johnson, as per se, in, in, in the UK. Of it, you know, We've hardly seen any workers leave for years and years and met Kevin a couple of years ago. And you know, he's, he's an incredible guy and he's, he's hugely knowledgeable about um, abortion in Africa. And you know, a lot of people don't know some of the most basic sort of information you know, that actually... You know, the British taxpayer is paying for and exporting abortions abroad, even to countries where it's illegal. And the healthcare provision, you've got pharmacies who are handing out the abortion pills in India. This is illegal. It's against the law. So like nearly half of Mary Stokes' business internationally is, is against the laws of these countries. Um, but, you know, people have really have a blind blind spot for this. And with just handing out the the pills in the pharmacy, you don't know what a woman's taking at the right time. There's complications. Uh, they might take the wrong dosage. Um, the pills might be out of date, et cetera, et cetera. There's so many complications that can happen. So in terms of actual care of uh, abortion provision, it's extremely poor quality. And this is, I think, uh, you know, both Sue Thayer and Kevin Duffy both left the abortion providers on the issue of telemedicine, of just how poor it is you know you're not really caring for people you're just providing them with the pills and you know often by video link etc and it's just awful healthcare even if you're in favor of abortions so if we can really get this message out and just show how bad the abortion provision is and what's really happening on the ground i think that will not only fire up the christians in africa but also show the flaws in the abortion provision in the uk of from the pro-abortion position what's being provided is miles off what they think it is so there's this huge disparity in views and reality and mm. reality and myth so that we can myth bust on an on a epic scale I think on this topic and that that's quite exciting you know we've got huge swathes of you know we could see Mary Stokes they got kicked out of Zambia um, they got temporarily closed in Nairobi and Kenya so we could see a whole country just you know we don't want you in here anymore you know we need to empower the African countries to say yeah, you know, we don't want you here anymore. Goodbye. You know, this is against our customs, our laws. We need to empower them to do that. And I, I believe that's possible. You, you know, we see mm -hmm. a whole country say no more. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> that would be fantastic. Yeah. 
<laughs> sure would. And you mentioned a couple of times, Robert, how you know as fantastic as it was for that that super clinic to close down, things are kind of changing from those you know physical clinics to this abortion pill that women are taking at home. Um, what is the future, do you think, of, of prayer vigils like those at 40 Days for Life? Is there always going to be a place for that? Or would the changing situation mean that um, you'll have to adapt to, in the pro-life movement to, to that new reality? Yeah, we still have a place for prayer vigils. If you've seen the film Unplanned with Abby Johnson, it shows the reality of like this home abortion, RU486 pill in the shower. Yes. It's a really intense um intense scene and that's really the worst end of the spectrum of a sort of at-home abortion kind of gone wrong um but there's always going to be space for prayer vigils and you know we're getting squeezed here in terms of just in the parliament two days ago they were talking about amending the policing bill to uh, making it a crime two years in jail for offering help for uh, women outside an abortion center so it it just kind of gets more ridiculous as time goes by you know we've seen the first buffer zone introduced and now you know, an attempt to bring it in nationwide mm. multiple times. And now, you know, like what's next? 50 years of jail. It's uh, it's kind of ludicrous. But I think God allows things to go to the nth degree. And we saw with Mary Stokes closing, evil exhausts itself. So we've had this pills by post regime and the government did a double U-turn bringing that in. Very disingenuous and, you know, awful health, awful sort of abortion provision for 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 women to have the pills at home you know the statistics we don't know where they're actually taking them now so all the statistics are fudged and you know making the connection between abortion mental health abortion depression with the pills at home it's anonymous it's nurse-led there's no doctors involved the the abortion providers still having the same money for just putting them in the post versus you know having several appointments so um, you know, I think the lies will eventually exhaust themselves, but pills by post is it's not in the interest of women. It's damaging. It's dangerous. It's anonymous. Um, and you've got the trauma of abortion in your own home. So, you know, when they were happening in the abortion center, at least, you know, the woman was seeing somebody in person and being given the pill, you're more like less likely to have complications. So that there's many flaws with this, this pills by post, but we're always, we're always going to have prayer vigils. And mm. even if we have a, a national ban, you know, um, God isn't stopped by any buffer zones. We had a prayer vigil 500 meters from the abortion center in Ealing in West London. And we still saw two babies saved. This is Lent a couple of years ago and just shows the power of providence, the power of prayer. A couple of people asking, where's the abortion center 500 meters away? So, um, you know, you think you think kind of, you know, what use are we doing praying so far away from the abortion center? Yes. And there we have you, you've helped you know, a couple of women choose life and, and one of them went to help their friend. So he was in a similar circumstance. So it just shows you um, God is in charge and, mm. you know, prayer works, you know, wherever you are. So you know, we, we believe in, in being in public space, but um, prayer works in, in every single location. So we mm. will keep going strong and keep growing and keep mm. taking every opportunity. That's beautiful. Thank you. So um, we're having that same issue in New Zealand right now with the um, so-called safe area legislation um, being put forward. Obviously, it's not safe. The area is not safe for um, pre-born babies, uh, but apparently it will be safe from people who pray. So it's uh, interesting to hear how uh, individual prayer vigils have managed to work around the the exclusion zones in, in the areas in the UK. Um, are you able to give a little bit more detail around how various prayer vigils have continued or or how they've worked around the, the law to at least still have some kind of a presence despite there being a buffer zone? Yes, absolutely. So we've had a very strong campaign from the pro-abortion movement here to bring in buffer zones uh, to the UK and they're still pushing very, very hard. So we currently have three buffer zones in the UK, one in Ealing in London, one in Twickenham in London and one in Manchester in uh, in northern, northern England. So we have three buffer zones that have been introduced by the local council, which in effect criminalises prayer for the first time since the Reformation here. Um, so literally it's a criminal act to stand and pray in public, which is utterly ridiculous. Um, and the other crazy thing in Ealing, a group called Sister Supporter were instrumental in bringing in the first ever buffer zone 
uh, first campaign group in history to actually engage in the activity they said they were opposing, which was harassing pro-lifers. They were against harassment, but they were actually involved in stirring up things to try and create a problem at the very beginning before they got wiser. So um, so these censorship zones, I mean, it's, it's really ridiculous law which has been brought in. We've challenged them legally. A lot of the cases haven't been heard. They've been thrown out by the lawyers in Europe, uh, European courts and also the High Court and Supreme Court here. So, you know, it bans help where it's needed most. We've had a lady called Alina, who was a mum who chose life for her own child outside the abortion clinic after being offered a leaflet and being offered help. And she's led the campaign called Be Here For Me, opposing opposing the buffer zones. Um, but we've kept on going with a vigil in, in Ealing, and that's 200 metres from the abortion centre at one end of the street. So you've still got uh, one out of two women coming down the street who are walking past going to the abortion centre. And the save rate has gone down 90% since not you're not allowed to be outside the abortion centre. But uh, I've always uh, admired that vigil so much because so much spiritual fruit has happened. We've had hundreds of lives saved from that vigil. And the building used to be a... A house of prayer it was by dorothy Kerrin, who owned the building it was a house of prayer she adopted uh, adopted children she moved out in the 1960s and then the building was bought by uh, you know bought by abortion provider in the in the 70s it's a huge building they do late-term abortions there um and yeah we to still see babies safe sometimes the taxi drivers drive the girls to the edge of the buffer zone um which is really beautiful and amazing and to hear the stories of saves when you're 200 meters away from the abortion center is absolutely incredible just the just the courage and the hope and what's actually happened is we've had two vigils there when 40 days has been on we've been down one end of the street and then the the permanent full-time vigil is at the uh the other end of the street and then we've had online prayers as well we've had priests come along every day doing exorcism prayers um so the place has been covered in prayer and at some point that huge building just like many others is going to close uh, evil is going to exhaust itself and i i, I think the, the biggest thing is having hope against hope and you see a law come in like this and some people give up and think okay we can't do anything more and in twickenham the building used to be a nun's convent it's now you know late-term abortion center um they've banned the vigil on the 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 next streets so and not only is it's banned on the main street it's banned on the next street so the only place you can really witness is by the train station now uh, which makes life quite complicated and the same with manchester too but um you know i'm always very positive because i have seen the spiritual results and you know at first you get persecuted and then you see a bigger victory so that's always been the kind of uh gandhi said you get ignored you get ridiculed you get persecuted and then you win so a lot of people kind of give up going oh this is hopeless this situation uh this situation kind of is is but we're dealing with a supernatural perspective of prayer and god isn't stopped by any buffer zones and in brighton they were just about to bring in a buffer zone the abortion center closed the same with uh Mary states whitfield street in london just about to bring in a buffer zone and it closed so you know some places close and some places get, get buffer zones you know and um the biggest thing we just keep witnessing because you know if we really knew the the power of you know, the power of our witness and the amount of people we can you know london's a very good place to witness outside abortion census there's like 10 major ones and there's you know take your pick in terms of getting a, a good campaign started here so you know, we can never underestimate the, the power, the importance of our work to see one woman choose life, like everything would be worth it just for saving that one life. So, um, yeah, take courage. You know, if you're getting attacked, it's because you're doing the right things. And, you know, the stronger the attack, the, the better you're doing. So everything is in inverse. So um, that's mm. how I see it. And how did it all work, Robert? Um, uh, you know, um, during the um, the lockdowns with COVID and, and the restrictions besides, what, what effect have, have those lock, uh, lockdowns and restrictions had on the volunteers and how's that all panned out in the UK? So, yeah, well, I mean, I've been very opposed to the lockdowns and, you know, we've had some of the most draconian laws in this country. Uh, during Lent, we couldn't legally stand in public um, because uh, it wasn't lawful to stand in public with several people. So... <laughs> Uh, we were left doing prayer walks around the abortion centres. Uh, we did lo <clears throat> a lot of events online. And one of our volunteers got a fine from the police, which we're contesting at the moment. Um, so, you know, we've got buffer zones, which is one issue. But but the shutting down the entire of society, closing every bar, restaurant, shop, 
um, for this so-called so-called um, pandemic, it's it's you know really taken things to a new level of uh, ridiculous. And but again, once again, you know, the sort of hopeless situation in, in some people's minds. But we've never found it easier to recruit leaders. And just the position in America, you know, like a magazine's going to seventy thousand homes, uh, over fifty vigils a year round now. Um, you thought 2020 was a bad year. We had a thousand babies saved in America in 2020. So you had all the riots, the fake election, you know, all, all this stuff going on in America. And you just think, well, what crazy place is that? And on the grassroots, things are totally flourishing. So, um, you know, so there's really, you know, renewed sense of hope here of despite all the craziness. And, you know, we weren't the only, the, the lockdown wasn't directed towards pro-lifers. It was directed towards everything to, to sort of decimating the economy and kind of destroying mm. everything. So, um, so uh, you know, I think you just really have to hunker down in that kind of situation. We weren't a- able to travel very much, um, but we've got great leaders all around the country. They haven't gone away and they've done everything that they can in the circumstances. And I did the mission trip around the UK in 2013. We went to nine abortion centres, um, Ealing, Whitfield Street, um, Bedford Square, Leamington Spa, Birmingham, Cardiff, Southampton and Brighton and uh, Milton Keynes as well. And uh, in that time, in eight years, five out of those nine abortion centres have closed. And, uh, you know, the kind of abortion landscape's completely different with these pills by post. Um, So it just shows you, you know, like the situation can seem hopeless from a natural perspective, but from a supernatural perspective, you Mm. you just don't know how God is touching people's hearts uh, we see a lot of angry people at the vigil and st thomas aquinas says the first reaction to truth is anger and um, when people are really angry it's you know can god can be stirring up their heart and they buried an abortion experience for decades and finally this has brought it up to the to the surface so you see a super angry person and think oh yikes what did i do wrong did i offend them and actually god's really stirring up their heart to sort of you know bring this terrible trauma uh, abortion experience to the surface to finally be resolved once and for all so you don't know how god is working and even if the whole of society looks like it's it's crumbling looking at social reform throughout history berlin wall falling you know communism ending things must have seemed completely hopeless in these countries for decades and you know finally communism just ends after 80 80 something years and think wow you know that this is something that can happen but you know we might have to go through an ice age first so (laughs) we've got to have things in perspective always um so we're really hoping and praying that more people will uh, take up the challenge to to have prayer vigils outside their abortion local abortion facilities so uh, in new zealand as you know Auckland's pretty steady and Wellington and Christchurch have been fantastic and hopefully next Lent we'll still have leaders uh, down there as well in those two cities. Uh, But what about people who are thinking, gosh, I wouldn't mind having a vigil outside my local um, abortion facility, but I'm not in one of those main cities. What What would your advice be to them, Robert? I would just really encourage them as much as possible. You don't need to have an abortion centre just to get out and pray in public. So we've got a, a vigil in Wales that's not outside an abortion centre. It's not an, not an abortion centre in Clenethley. Um, there's plenty of places that don't have an abortion centre and a witness in the public squares in Mexico where they don't have one. So um, I think, you know, for anyone who's keen, passionate, enthusiastic, just go for it. And, it, you know, it doesn't matter where you live. Um We've had vigils in in America, which they don't have an abortion provider in their town and they've still galvanized a, a lot of people. So, you know, and you just think, you know, there's billions of people on the planet. There's so many opportunities and there's always the chance to go deeper, to find more leaders, to find more volunteers. And it doesn't matter whether there is an abortion center in your community or not in terms of whether you want to run a run a campaign and run a vigil and, and God can work in different ways. I mean, it provides a focal point as obviously this is praying to end abortion, um, but you can still witness where, wherever you live. And um, yeah, there's over 60 million people in, in this country and just, you know, millions of people are post-abortive. There's public witness is really powerful and there's so many different ways to do community outreach. I mean, just showing the film unplanned has done such good all around the world to, 
the pro-life movement and there's just so many different ways to galvanize inspire empower people and you know taking a mission and just using our imagination now how can we reach more people um how can we be a reservoir for god's grace for god to work in and through our actions our efforts and to reach more people than we ever have done before so new zealand's a small country but you know you think dunedin uh lots of kaikoura there's lots of other smaller towns where you know even one person standing up you know running a decent campaign there like the whole town is going to see that and in Ireland, you know, they're quite shy because everyone knows each other and um, everyone knows each other and they're kind of worried about what their neighbours think and this kind of thing. But, you know, rather than worrying about what people think of us and overcoming the fear, um, thinking of you know, what good can we do by take, taking a stand? And some people will like us and some people will hate us, but, you know, we can get over that and overcome the fear and just get out there and, and, and do mm. our best. That's the best way to go. Certainly agree that it's a, uh as a leader it's definitely a worthwhile activity to get involved in and it's not our work it's god's work um Mm. just just say yes yeah yeah a lot of people are afraid and a lot of people are afraid and it's just think yeah and then they get a spiritual attack or something from uh something will happen or you know they'll just be really put off the idea of and and you know just nervous and I, I was afraid you know I was, I was thought okay why what people are going to think and what have you but I like my in, inhibitions were lost quite quickly because uh you've got to get a thick skin in terms of being in London and people are people are going to tell you where to go they're going to stick up the finger towards you and they're going to effing blind at you so if you don't have a thick skin then um, you're going to grow one fairly quickly and you'll be chucked in the deep end um this is in London I mean every place is different so you know if you're standing in public and you know abortion people have different views on and you just don't know where people are at so um yeah you just not worry about what people mm. think and just you know do what god wants you to do and that's the most important thing and if you're doing that then mm. miracles literally can happen every day yeah so true it's certainly personally speaking it's the reason i'm here today working for family life <clears throat> international was just a handful of years ago um, coming along to see what what they get up to and just intuitively that's the front line of the pro-life movement doesn't it that that face out there and and praying and being that witness and yeah it is scary each, each time i um <clears throat> i do it but it, it's so powerful and um you know that that god's there and and it's doing real good yeah we, we are on the front line of a spiritual battle between life and death and literally you know, you've got a woman going in for an abortion center and there's nobody else there. And this is the last sign of hope for anybody who's going for that abortion. And we can be the first sign of mercy for anyone who's had an abortion. And, you know, some women have come up to us here in the UK and said, well, you know, where were you when I had my abortion? You know, there was nobody outside. There was nobody offering that help. And it, you know, many women have no idea that there's other people out there who love them who care for them if there's any tangible need that they have financial need housing counseling financial support um, whatever it is they you know that would help them choose life if they knew that that was available then you know that's a choice and that's a that's a real choice of of being offered the abortion providers it's an abortion or nothing at all but we're outside saying you know any tangible you need you have we're here for you we love you we support you we don't judge you and anything you need, you know, we're, we're here for you. And that's a message of love. It's not harassment. It's not it's not hate. And that's a message of love. And when you reach people at that level, then that's pretty incredible. I can't think of many places in society that are, have less mm-hmm. hope than an abortion centre. Um, it is a hopeless place. And we're there to bring hope and to bring love. And, you know, uh, St. John of the Cross said, you know, where there is no love, place love and you will draw love out. And, you know, that's exactly... Uh, exactly what we're doing and uh, we get all the kind of the the hurt and the abuse and uh, the hurt and the abuse and the mothers pushing their girl daughters into having abortions forcing them in you see the ugliness or the reality of the abortion on the local level by being there but that's this is where god wants to be and this is how we can be as hands and feet. Fantastic. Do you have any uh, final stories or advice that you want to share with with the listeners today? Yeah, well, I just really encourage everybody as much as possible. You know, what you're doing is life changing. It, this is a life transforming ministry. And it's not not just other people who can be, you know, save lives from this ministry. This can transform yourself. Um, when I was in the States, uh, 
when uh, Four Cities for Life uh, now owns our international headquarters is the building in which uh, Abby Johnson used to work. It's in the film Unplanned. And uh, shortly after we purchased that building, I actually went inside the building. Um, uh, Sean had the keys. And so the building was just transferred ownership between Planned Parenthood and, you know, bought by Four Cities for Life secretly. And so went in the building and could really feel tangibly uh, there were I think over 6,000 abortions in that building one of the rooms the women, the women would sit down in sort of armchairs and have a cookie and a bit of orange juice after the abortions and you could tangibly feel uh, the evil that was in that a building kind of still when it was just purchased they'd had prayers in the buildings and they had scripture passages written on the wall. It was a little bit creepy, um, but you could really. I've been to Auschwitz, and you know, just the the feeling there is is something very very off. And it was very much the same for this building. And now it's been refurbished and totally normal building. And it's you wouldn't have that feeling at all. But just after it was purchased, you could really feel. Uh, we've now got a memorial there for the, all the babies, six thousand four hundred that were aborted there. Um, but you could really feel at that time just like the you know there was something tangibly evil in you know still in the building there's a there's a metal container that took the products of conception as Planned Parenthood called them into the into the lab from having the abortion and a, a, a mobile hook uh, that were held a mobile to distract the woman while she was having the abortion the, the hook is still in the the ceiling so I, I'll never forget that experience that we had. Um, that we had there in in um, Planned Parenthood uh, former building, and that's really inspired me to sort of keep going and to know that you know abortion does evil exhaust itself at some point, and you know we we can be uh, the front runners sort of seeing God's grace. So I have a front row seat seeing God's grace in action with this work, and you know a lots at stake. So lots at stake, you know. So there's there's so much good that we can do, and to trust in God um, that He has the ultimate victory. And uh, we had another dinner in London once. And um, so all our events have been protested for about five years. So we had a private dinner for about 100 people. And um, we got to the restaurant and there were protesters outside. And my, my heart sank. <laughs> so, um, I thought, oh, no, our event has been protested yet again. <laughs> I tried really hard for it not to be protested. Um, but it turns out the protesters were protesting the restaurant for um, selling lobsters <laughs> rather than the, the pro-lifers. <laughs> so, um, so what they'd done, they chalked on the pavement, um, lobsters are murdered here in chalk. And, you know, it's like, you know, down to Brown's restaurant, <laughs> lobsters are murdered here with signs and stuff. So we just laughed when we saw that. Of uh, you know, it wasn't a it wasn't a pro-abortion protest. It was a it was a lobster restaurant <laughs> protest. And uh, what was even funnier was there was a couple looking for supper and walking by on the pavement, and uh, they saw the they saw the chalkings on the pavement. You know, lobsters are murdered here, and they said, "Oh, lobsters and delicious," and <laughs> walked into the restaurant. <laughs> so. Uh, their protest had seemingly been somewhat sort of uh, counterproductive it's a kind of marketing for the uh, for the restaurant but thankfully our event wasn't wasn't protested in the end and there was a eccentric group uh, protesting animals outside so um so there's always a bit of humor you know it's a chance for a bit of humor with a with a pro-life movement and um you know it's uh yeah it's a difficult topic and a difficult topic to deal with but there's always chance for a, for a bit of fun too and we're definitely a people of hope and um and we're people that love life and fun is part of that so um one um, thank you very much robert for joining us today and sharing so many heartwarming and encouraging words about being effective prayer um, volunteers and, and being out there on the street and witnessing to life and praying for an end to abortion. We really appreciate all that you do uh, for the international community with 40 Days for Life. And we certainly appreciate your help here personally with us. So um, yeah, thanks for being here. And uh, just wanted to let people know that if if you wanted to read about more stories, uh, you can do. We've got uh, many books from 40 Days for Life that are different titles that talk about the different stories and share the different stories from around the world of Baby Saved and the way that God is moving on the streets uh, through people that just say yes. 
um, you can find them at fli.org.nz. Thanks again, Robert. Well, thank you, Michelle and Brad. You're doing incredible work with Family Life International, and it's such an important postulate. Um, it, you know, you're doing groundbreaking work with with Family Life, and, and thank you for partnering with Forty Days for Life. And there's so much good work to do for, you know, for the church, for marriage, for life, for the pro life movement, and you are doing that work. So keep up the amazing work. It's small country, New Zealand, but there's still so so much good work to be done, and you know, one person at a time. So. Keep up the amazing work and and wishing you every blessing with your ministry. Thanks, Robert. Thank you, Robert. God bless you. It was great chatting to Robert, and I hope you are inspired by listening to our conversation today. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Please get involved and help save lives this coming Lent in 40 Days for Life. You can join your local 40 Days for Life vigil, or you can put your hand up and lead one. Don't forget, it begins on Ash Wednesday, 2nd of March, 2022. If you would like to support FLI and hear our future content when it comes out, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Instagram and Facebook, and sign up for Pro-Life and Family News at fli.org.nz.